Hello and welcome to the 24th annual Get Lit Festival. I'm Kate Peterson, Director of Get Lit Programs, a nonprofit organization housed within Eastern Washington University. Our program is responsible for Get Lit, Washington State's longest running annual literary festival, which hosts readings, writing workshops, craft classes, panel discussions, and much more. This year, we're excited to be hosting in-person events taking place this Thursday through Sunday, April 21st through 24th, in many venues across downtown Spokane. And of course, we're very happy to be back with you in this virtual space as well. You can find a full schedule of in-person and virtual events, along with information about all of our festival authors by visiting our website, getlitfestival.org. Today, I would like to welcome you to New Women Poets from Empty Bowl Press, which celebrates three talented poets, Holly J. Hughes, Shin Yi Pai, and Ann Spires. I will now hand the reins over to Holly, who will get the event started by telling us a bit more about Empty Bowl Press. Take it away, Holly. Thank you so much, Kate, and thanks to you and all your staff. We're excited to be appearing virtually as part of Get Lit. So I'm honored to be one of the women poets with recent books out from Empty Bowl. And I'm just gonna give a brief introduction to the press and then I'll introduce our first reader. Since 1976, Empty Bowl has published literary anthologies, collections of poetry and books of Chinese translation. The press promotes the work of writers and artists who share the founding purpose and fundamental theme which is literature and responsibility and support of communities, human communities and wild places. According to the co-founder and current publisher, Michael Daly, the, na the name Empty Bowl can mean both replenishment and the gift that moves. And the gift has been moving. Over the years, Empty Bowl has published an anthology titled Working the Woods, Working the Sea, Poetry essays and translations by a number of Northwest poets, including Michael Connor, Judith Roach, Jody Eliason, Finn Wilcox, Michael Daly, Tom Jay, Clemens Stark, John Brandy, Red Pine, and Bill Yake, among others, and most recently, of course, the three of us. Also, just some recent update and recent news. In 2020, Michael Daly launched the Madrona Project, which is a biannual journal that offers work by poets and writers who write in and of this world, outside the mainstream or simply outdoors. And again, which reflects the press's mission. The first issue was a fest shrift for Clement Stark, and it's a gathering of responses to one or more of the poems in Clem Stark's Cathedrals and Parking Lots, which was published, I believe, in 2019. And that includes testimonials from a range of poets, scholars, laborers, artists, collaborators, and friends who all contributed reactions, personal histories, and appreciations. And it's a really wonderful overview of the work of, of Clemens Stark, who is a, an Oregon poet, longtime Oregon poet. I was invited to edit the second issue um, titled Keep a Green Bow, Voices from the Heart of Cascadia. And for this issue, here's the, a, a view of it. For this issue, I invited 64 women writers and artists from the Northwest to reflect on what it means to live and write in the Cascadian bioregion at the end of 2020, which was a momentous year. I reached out to poets and essayists from Alaska to Oregon on both sides of the Cascades, both established and emerging writers, including indigenous voices and those who work the land and sea. And I'm grateful to Washington State Poet Laureate Rena Priest, who wrote a really moving preface. The third issue of the Madrona Project is due back from the printer any day now and will be available on the Empty Bowl website on February 1st. Two more issues are in the works. Number four will be edited by Sam and Sally Green up on Walvern Island and number five by Rena Priest. So thank you to Anne for suggesting that the three of us propose this reading. And um, we're gonna move into the reading now. Just a little bit of an overview. Um, coming from different perspectives, we each write about the fragility, transience and resilience of the natural world. Anne's chapbook, Rain Violet, captures climate crisis and quatrains linked with weather symbols. 
My collection Hold Fast celebrates the Buddhist concept of 10,000 sorrows and 10,000 joys as a way of holding fast in challenging times. And Xin Yi's collection Virga goes deeper into Buddhist thought from lived experience. So leading, off, leading us off will be Anne Spires. Anne lives on Vashon Island in Puget Sound. She was its first poet laureate and stewards its poetry post in the town square. She enjoys a welcome rain of recent publications. In 2021, Rain Violence from Empty Bowl and Back Cut from Black Heron were both released. In 2022, Ravenna launches Harpoon in its chapbook triple series. She is dedicated to the craft and art of book. Among her books are letterpress editions from Brooding Heron, Herodotus poems, Day, Volcano Blue, Tide Turn, and A Wild Taste. Anne attended the University of Washington, earning an MA in English Lit and Creative Writing with a focus on plays and poems. She works to conserve and restore the island, the traditional indigenous land of the Shwasha or Swiftwater people. Please welcome Anne Spires. Thank you, Holly. Thank you so much. Um, my Empty Bowl book is, I have the cover here, is Rain Violet. The design was by um, Tonya Namura of Grey Dog Press in Spokane. So um, we, we, we celebrate Spokane um, by enjoying their gifts. And um, Bolinas Frank, a visual artist, did the international weather symbols. Uh, he took the, the icons, the symbols off of, of, the, of the internet and, um, and made them for me. Here's, here's two of them. So here's more familiar rain. These were used, these symbols were, were used by weather watchers who from the 1700, late 1700s on as, as um, instruments to observe weather in their own backyard or wherever um, uh, became available and they still are available with a computer and they're still affordable. And so they started marking the weather conditions on a piece of paper and they and they were called their weather maps and um uh so i'm going to uh, read from this and i first have to share screen down here someplace there go there we go it's always a good moment okay now i have to go back Okay, rain violet. Weather station on top of a mountain. Ants stream like red monks, lining up to collect sweet from whatever heat rises and from everything tongue pretty with nectar in winter sleep slip into warming. Drizzle thick. I'm going to share here. Drizzle thick. Mary loses her face first. Jesus last. The paeta erodes to a curve holding an agony. Rain dissolves Golgotha's small wounds. Ice pellets. What are the blue orbs on the fruit trees? Apples wrapped in gauze. Too precious to leave naked to hails bruising, maggots worming, or migrant workers' quick hands. Glory. Woody Guthrie travels on fresh tar, singing roll on Columbia, roll the heavy sun across the high deserts, buckling freeways and dams crumbling as the great rivers dry. Mirage, out of the scrub, children in red t-shirts run chasing America like a soccer ball. 
Border guns collect boys with little sisters. Mama said, north, walk north, night, star bright. Dust storm severe, bison shot and their dung now dust. At the buffalo chip toss, giggling teens fling Idaho spuds and a Cherokee executes a hoop dance among the paling camas. Thunder herd, snake skins shunting in the wind like riffs from a broken guitar. Snakes too starved to rattle, hang from bushes to beat the heat. We tow the dead with fancy cowboy boots. Thunder with rain heavy. Dropped out of a downpour, snow geese winter in the inundated fields, web feet compacting soil. Farmers fire into the flood of cackling. Wings undulate across the flats. Snow blowing. From snow, animals dig bunch grass. Narcissa Whitman covers the table with a white cloth, no matter the news. In time, gone the cloth, the bunch grass. Squall. Wind scours pollen from the cherry blossoms. 10,000 years of hybridizing gone. Fickle wind mixes this and it's unlike that. We are out with our Q-tips, trying. Sky obscured, smoke, dust, sulfur dioxide. He kills his wife. She leaves her hand too long in the neighbor's grip, helping her from the boat. He kills his enemy, son, father, dog, and all the others for less. Fog, shallow, patchy. Stress, they say. White feathers mark the black crow's wings. Soon all white, pecking bleached seaweed on the vacated beach, done as tricksters. Drizzle, not freezing. The moon's ragged edge rasps dusk. We walk out into the field of wet. Our garden's last cut, mint or cane or nettle. Grief in every handful. Rain freezing slight. Nettles collapsing in the long loss. Winter wrens quiet their soft sing. Rain silvering blue iris and the crows crack recedes. What Theresia saw was this. Rain violet. They on the shore are not us. In the ra rain, they set their boats on fire. Wood ignites the plastic smoke, black and acrid. To slake thirst, they open their mouths, faces up. Snow crystals, starlight. Out of the boat, kindness steps. She is pregnant, full. She has done this before, stepping out of boats, rocking, finding balance, grasping the bird's tail. So, so um, I did about 60 or 70 of, of the 90 um, international weather symbols. And um, I think Empty Bowl made, me, made us a beautiful book. And I'd like to read one more poem from the Madrona Project, Keep a Green Bow. So all of you who have mailboxes out on the road, uh, maybe you will enjoy the long walk during COVID times. And um, the end of this poem deals with an Enzo 
which is to take a brush and ink, and as a meditation, you draw circles over an enzo over and over again. Sometimes they're open, sometimes they're closed, but it's a form of meditation. Enzo, open, closed. The flush landscape disappears in a push of erasures, leaving an alphabet of sticks and spaces to reassemble in the slot between gray dawn and sunset's muting of light. Rain freezes mid-drop. My gloved hand pulls the newspaper from its box roadside. The walk back takes months of nothing. Fever few broken in my fingers and scotch broom pods pop in the odd heat. Last game, my turn up the bat. From the old man's orchard, we all steal apples. Maggots thread the flesh with brown silk. White buckets wait at the fence. Shadow pushes sun. Strapped to her gurney, Cassiopeia is left on stage. A fistful of stars smudged in the smoke of a hard day's night. The West is on fire. Our last swim through herds of jellyfish. Moons they are, their gonads thickening orange, bumping us, their glisten sliding over and under. We burn fists of soft rush, mix ash and water for ink. Our letters ascend and descend. The letter O slows our progress. Perhaps the circle closed or open if we lift the brush, relenting. Thank you so much. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Holly J. Hughes. She's the author of four poetry collections, Hold Fast, Passings, Sailing by Ravens, Boxing the Compass, as well as co-author of The Pen and the Bell, Mindful Writing in a Busy World, and editor of the award-winning anthology, Beyond Forgetting, Poetry and Prose about Alzheimer's Disease. Her fine art chapbook, Passings, received an American Book Award in 2017. Most recently, she served as editor for the second volume of the Madrona Project, Keep a Green Bow, Voices from the Heart of Cascadia from Empty Bowl. She's a graduate of Pacific Lutheran University's Low Residency MFA program, where she served on the staff for 13 years. After teaching writing at college level for several decades, she now lives on the Olympic Peninsula where she leads writing and mindfulness workshops, consults as a writing coach, and directs Flying Squirrel Studio, which offers writing residencies for women in Indianola. To know more about Holly, link up to hollyjhughes.com. Holly, you're on. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, boy, I'm glad you, thank you for adding that poem of yours from Keep a Green Bow. I, I really love it. And it's a nice segue into the reading that I'll be doing and um, Jin Yi as well. Yeah, I'm lucky in that um, Hold Fast came out right before the pandemic and I actually got to do my book launch in person. It seems like so long ago now, <laughs> but got to do a few readings before the pandemic arrived and we all moved online. And so, um, yeah, so I'm gonna read the first poem in the collection thinking it might help to set the tone a bit. It's a short poem called Bittersweet. Bittersweet, my mother called it, filling the back of the station wagon with tangled branches. The only way she knew to bring what's wild inside the tidy rooms of her colonial. How could I know it would trail me all these years with its bright eyes? Sweet bitter, Sappho called it, knew too well the heart's grammar, that the tang of cherries lingers longer than the sweet, that the ripe fig sweetens as its skin begins to pucker, 
It is just they are so intertwined. We can't greet one without the other. One's bright twin, one's lengthening shadow. And the epigraph, one of the epigraphs that I used, I, I'm a great fan of the work of Jane Hirschfield and um, one of her books, The Lives of the Heart. I just carried it around with me for a few years and have since she's written a lot of books since then too, but I, I do go back to that one. And here's a line that I, I really like that I think helps helped me um, sort of define what I was trying to do. Then the world is that actress from a Sanskrit poem whose greatness was showing two feelings at once. So the next poem is called Shishi Odoshi. I was living on my boat in Eagle Harbor on Bainbridge Island. And in order to get off the boat, I joined the Bloedel Reserve, which has wonderful miles and miles of hiking, walking trails. And one of the trails goes through a Japanese garden. And in that garden is something called a deer scare. And I ended up writing about it one day, not knowing the Japanese name. And I, I learned later that it's um, Shishi Odoshi. So that's the title of the poem. And you'll hear about the deer scare in the poem itself. Pursue. Listen how smoothly stream slips over stones downhill to where hollow bamboo waits for cool water to fill its dry throat. Then the thuck against stone as it dips like a heron darting for fish. Fast, a simple movement to frighten the boars that roamed the gardens of the Zen monks in the 14th century. Six centuries later, I listen to the sound of emptiness filling until it pivots. The molecule of water that carries it over no different from the rest, but the movement quick as the heart without mind. Empty and fill, fill and empty, neither first nor last, but flowing together, the movement of filling carrying the emptying as the hollow vase carries air, as the heart empties and fills each day with 10,000 sorrows and 10,000 joys. And the next poem is written, was written a while ago, but I'd like to read it in part as a tribute to um, Thich Nhat Hanh, who passed on to the next realm or continued as he would say, his continuation um, last Sunday. And I was lucky enough to spend a week with Thich Nhat Hanh in 2004 at Deer Park Monastery, which is a retreat center in um, Southern California. And it was life-changing. It was transformative on every level. And I was lucky enough to go with the poet Tess Gallagher. So we did this together, which of course was a wonderful bonding experience. Um, so this is called Moon Phases at Deer Park Monastery for Tess. The first night, moon full. Each night after, moon's light and retreat, darkness standing by, light held in the curve of space it holds for itself until fullness fades and the dipper empties its cargo of stars into the black cauldron of sky. We arrive full bags heavy with books, heads brimming with words. Each day we let go what we can, see beauty in soup bowls, shaved heads, brown robes. Days pass in slow step, moon arcs across the sky. Then the last night, we walk arm in arm under a black cloak of stars, share the ginger singe of black, black gum, and stars wink back each one a poem we won't need to write. So it's interesting with those of you who've done meditation retreats before and in, in the Buddhist tradition, you, you do not read and write during that time. And it's hard for two poets to go on a retreat and not read and write. So, so we, um, but we managed to do it mostly. Okay, the next poem is the title poem, Hold Fast. And, um, yeah, I, this is a good poem to read today. It's a really foggy morning where I live um, and it starts out with fog. Hold fast, last week of August, too soon for falling leaves, fog that rises at dawn, ghosts up the beach, geese lining up in their ragtag bee. 
Beyond the sandstone ledge carved like a torso by the waves. Beyond purple sea stars inching toward tide pools, ribbons of bull kelp drift with the tide, ebb and flow, anchored to the seafloor by a half inch barnacle called a hold fast. It knows the principle of hunkering down, riding out the storm, staying put. All winter beneath the sea's relentless chop, it holds fast, gives over to each storm, flows with each rising tide. All winter it lets go what it can, holds fast to the rest. That's what we'll do, hold fast to what sustains. Our friends, a steaming bowl of soup this beach. So this was written at my, my beloved beach in Indianola, which is on um, Suquamish indigenous land. And the more and more, more I learn about it, the more grateful I am for their stewardship of it. The next one, we come back to Jane Hirschfield with another epigraph. And um, this is where I tie in a little bit with, with Anne's reading. Um, she was, in powerful poems looking at um, climate change and weather. And this one looks at it from the point of view of the sea, which of course is being affected, rising seas and, and ocean acidification as well. And so those you'll hear those references in the first couple lines. Rising, and then the epigraph. But out of such persistence arose turtles, rivers, mitochondria, figs all this resinous, unretractable earth. And that's from her poem titled Optimism. Each day seas rise, pteropods release spiraling wings, swirl together in the dervish of dissolving beings as jellyfish gather mass and drift. What about that idealism we carried all those years unsinged? It's not too late to hold fast to what sustains, even as it sinks from sight. Steadiness of stone, grass, riffling wind, bright eye of flicker at the window, bats, outstretched, translucent wing, each shuddering strand of spider web, each resilient vine and tendril. Send down resinous roots, connect deep underground, enduring, invisible, quietly rising, resisting threads of mycelium. I've just finished reading a book some of you may have read as well, The Mother Tree by Dr. Suzanne Samard. And in it, she was one of the researchers who um, responsible for finding out that underneath all the trees are uh, this vast network of mycelium and that trees are communicating with each other. And, um, I'm so grateful for her work as a scientist and for this knowledge that I think we might have known somewhat intuitively that, um, that they're communicating too. And my last poem, it's a short poem and I'll end with Elemental. Thank you so much for this opportunity to read. And I just wanna give a little shout out to North Press who printed a beautiful um, letterpress broadside of this poem in Shishi Odoshi. This is a letterpress in Port Townsend. Primary colors. Early sun lights each square prayer flag as it shudders in the wind. Red, green, yellow. Primary colors we learned in elementary school. What is primary? What is elemental but this? The gray cat stretched on a terracotta deck, eyes closed, tail twitching, dreams of mice. The red dog back from his morning walk, kibble in his belly asleep on a green blanket, whimpers, dreams of rabbits. Me in blue fleece watching a spider web take shape, perfect in its trembling symmetry, each strand shimmering. And the golden spider at the heart of its work resting, lit by sun, as we all hang together, shuddering light and shadow. So thank you. And I will, I'm honored now to move on to our final reader. We'll finish up with a reading by Xinyi Pai. 
Xinyi Pai is a poet, essayist, and visual artist. She is the author of several books of poetry, including Virga, which is from Empty Bowl, and so from Entre Rios books, sightings, selected works, um, let's see, Ah uh, Arcs and Adamantine from White Pine and Equivalence from La Alameda. She served as the fourth poet laureate of the city of Redmond from 2015 to 2017 and has been an artist in residence for the Seattle Art Museum, Town Hall Seattle and Pacific Science Center. In 2014, she was nominated for a Stranger Genius Award in Literature. She is a three-time fellow of McDowell and has also been in residence at Taipei Artist Village, Seoul Mountain, the Ragdale Foundation, Centrum, and the National Park Service. Her visual work has been shown at the Dallas Museum of Art, the McKinney Avenue Contemporary, Three Arts Club of Chicago, and the Museum of American Jazz. Her poetry films have screened at the Zebra Poetry Film Festival and the Northwest Film Forum's Cadence Video Poetry Festival. Her personal essays have appeared in Tricycle, Atlas Obscura, City Arts, and Yes Magazine. She received her MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and studied poetics and translation at the Naropa Institute. She also holds an MA in Museology from the University of Washington. Currently, she serves as Program Director for Town Hall Seattle and hosts the Lyric World Poetry Podcast. Please welcome Xinyi Pai. I want to thank uh, Anne and Holly for organizing this event on behalf of Empty Bowl Press. Uh, so part of what Holly talked about in her introduction to this event was um, the overall mission of Empty Bowl, which uh, explores the notion of what is fragile, what is threatened, and the love and preservation of human communities. So um, that's how I'll curate the poems that I'll read today. Um, and I'll say too that uh, we're making this recording on the eve of the Lunar New Year. So um, as we sort of enter into that time that is important to uh, many Asian American communities, I decided to pull together a set of poems that really reflect those experiences. This first piece is called Ong Bao White Envelope and is for Kun Wun. Across the Chinese diaspora, our elders insert crisp new bills into miniature red envelopes to be shared with the young on the occasion of a new year, a birthday, the benediction. These crimson gifts appeared on irregular occasions throughout my girlhood. If grades were high, if times were good, if the family business was net positive that year. As kids, we anticipated the amounts inside the gilded Ong Bao based on our performance of what qualified or counted as good. My parents, retire, my parents retired trade after trade. We spent years living in the red, the failed shiitake mushroom farm, the shuttered gift shop, an obsolete import business. We lived off credit. As an adult, I cataloged the collections of a cultural museum and encountered the red envelope that I didn't see for decades. Unsure of the Chinese characters printed across its front, I asked my peer from the mainland to confirm its use. She laughed. I didn't know the markings indicated its use for a wedding. Red with shame, I pictured a bride tucking the parcel into her cleavage. When I stopped depositing his checks, I pictured my father growing red with ire. He found other ways to reach me, posting unmarked envelopes of cash through the mail, imagining American dollars could be as secure a transaction as gold. The bills wouldn't expire or lose their exchange value. The bachelor poet has sent funds to my son since he was two. He is not my boy's father. The $20 bills arrive enclosed within a plain white business envelope stamped with a chop. The image is of goldfish transforming into yin and yang. No red ink, just black, just white, this note. My father once told me that his sister in San Francisco used to steal money from her gambler husband's trousers when he was asleep in order to send money to him in China when he was going to middle school. Those days, graduates of high school can become teachers. My father came to the US at 18 and worked in the Oakland Naval Shipyards. He always told his children to go get the best education possible, and that includes non-school learning as well. He was a practical man. I am not so much. Enclosed is something extra for Tomo. Best wishes, Kuhn. 
Before I was born, our surname had already been altered. The paternal grandmother mandated we take the bachelor's name for our own to honor a relation outside the ancestral bloodline. We were relatively new to the country then too, transplants from Fujian to Taiwan. The patriarch of our family gone, it was the benevolence of a stranger that made life tolerable. No one got rich, everyone had food to eat. From Thai, we became Pai. Wun is not your true name any more than Pai is mine. We do not wear red or believe in luck. My ancestors were never at Gamshan, nor were they present at the remembrance of the golden spike. We are biologically unrelated, yet across dialect, generation, and clan, we do not ask whether we belong to one another. Like the koi that you choose to seal your stories, the connection to what's Chinese transmutes into care for all of our relations. Uh, this poem is about activism and the women's march that took place in Seattle in 2017. White Savior Industrial Complex. While reading a white activist book on civil disobedience, I encountered the passage of that time he evaded Johnny Law by hiding with his friends in yellow face on stage, the wrong side of Murder Creek. I think how activism like feminism often fails people. Like that time, 175,000 protesters armed with pussy hats marched through Chinatown on the eve before the Lunar New Year without giving the community notice ahead of time, never considering how they'd close streets, affect traffic, or impact business on what would usually be the busiest weekend of the year, even Uwaji Maya seeing a sharp drop in sales. On ceremony, an old crush sent me porcelain dinnerware when I married, as if to mark my entry into the society of good wives. The plates were yellow and had shattered in transit from his home in Las Vegas to my temporary outpost. I said nothing because like the plates, I am yellow, that is Asian. We people pleasers of many secrets, like how I learned to hide what's outdated, like that hideous Yixing teapot my mother puts out every time the giver who gave it comes to visit. Chiang Kai-shek Boneyard. The streets have been renamed by politicians to bear fewer remembrances of colonial times as society evolves to retire master narratives. What would it mean to my father and his generation to regard this graveyard of the past collected together in one memorial park? Acres of bronze busts all over the nation, monuments beheaded, spray painted with graffiti or simply taken down. The generalissimo as wounded hero, the dictator riding out on a dogged steed, soldiers salute each day in choreographed displays of military honor for one who lays putrefying in state guarded by young men in white uniforms who perform daily acts of allegiance, forbidden from taking photographs of the tomb. I focused instead on the 20 year old cadets saluting the ruler who never commanded them, sweating in the heat of midday, the vacant face of the recruit, his brow patted dry by a superior while standing at something less than full attention. Um, I'd like to also read a, a poem um, that is not in uh, my book, Ferga, but is uh, something that I wrote uh, during the last year of pandemic. And um, I think what I'd like to say about it is, uh, I'd like to dedicate it to Michelle Goh, the Asian American woman who was pushed in front of an oncoming subway train in New York a few weeks ago um, that killed her upon impact. So. This poem is very much a reflection on um, what the experiences of Asian Americans and Asian American women have been during the last couple of years. She and her and he and him and they and them and I and we. An unmarried girl from mainland China is murdered. Her remains refused out of custom by her own people. Old country traditions making the sum parts of her lived life somehow smaller unspoken norms I swear to resist. Strangers collect her body in Kennesaw, Georgia, 
two weeks after her bullet-ridden corpse remained unclaimed from the morgue. Twelve times a year, she sent money home to build more rooms, a bigger house for her mother, brother, clan. When the family patriarch died, she quit school as a teen, worked in factories, her past now forgotten, to be remembered as spa worker, undocumented illegal, a manless girl, not sister, daughter, migrant, model parents will frighten their children, point to her example as who not to be, the risk of going too far, forsaking a husband, breaking with belief. The ancestors can't keep close watch over faithfulness if they don't board planes, speak English. Her voice was loud and direct like a male. She behaved like an improper daughter with the freedoms of a man, with the liberties of those that are given immortality not realizing a woman of color who asserts her freedom pays with her life. My six-year-old boy is old enough to remember his first protest in support of Black Lives Matter. We circled 20 city blocks, horns blaring, hand-drawn signs taped to the car windows. Before the vaccine, we weren't ready to march, piling instead into our tiny black sedan to caravan with other families from the neighborhood school. Before the convoy, I explained to my son what happened to George Floyd, how his life was harmed, how someone in uniform who looks like mommy turned the other way while a human life was snuffed out. In those last moments, how the dying man cried out for his mother who could not hear him, how we must never stop using our privilege to listen, to name what is inhumane. They came with their vision for a better future, my parents, like so many Chinese before them, my father's head full of John Wayne flicks, movie heroes with cowboys and villains, American beauty embodied in the ideal of Doris Day, not Anna Mae Wong. When I warn them both of the uptick in the violence, I know they will say they have outlived world wars, martial law, poverty, and debt collection. These crimes happen 20 miles away to other Asians in some other part of town. Other Asians say the shooter slipped through the craps. Mental illness, one bad apple, because to admit the structures of hate are so much larger than any one of us is to erase the fantasy that a better life was ever available to us beyond a dream. Our stories acted out by people that look and sound nothing like us. I knew by the time I was 12 that I could never be white passing. The boy that was my classmate in grade school claimed I'd been his first girlfriend in kindergarten, held his sweaty hand, been his first love, even as he told everyone to hate that I came from a family of communists. None of it true. We felt sorry for you, he stated, as I looked for some sign of alliance in a white mother, his Mexican father, because he bore a name that marked him as different too, whether or not he spoke the language of his antecedents. My father so outraged he gave the school administrator an earful, resulting in my antagonist having to write a research paper on the origins of communism and how it's distinct from other Asian identities, including my own. We fought back with our minds and our words, but not our bodies, which remember their own truths. The cold touch of the six inch blade that I bought from my, brother, from my brother's friend in high school, I carried with me throughout my teens. The canister of mace I bought in college after being followed and groped on the street by a man that assaulted only Asian women. In more recent days, I consider other forms of self-defense. Right, leaning, well-meaning strangers tell me to acquire a license for a handgun, since nothing ends an argument like putting a hole in someone. The only witness on the scene reported that the shooter locked the doors aimed for their heads like the streetwalker with a hammer who struck out at the woman's skull, the invader who beat the old woman unconscious with a concrete brick in her own shop, the first responder who threw rocks hidden inside a sock like a weapon at the mass face of the Japanese teacher of school children, taking away her capacity to smile. These days, we choose to keep our kids away from school. I am, we are part of a growing count, what we have to do to keep ourselves alive. Where I'd only known the menace of more violent attacks before, been the recipient of hate mail, stalking, anonymous messages that threatened, no matter how many white guys you fuck, you'll never be white. At the heart of why, no one wants to call any of these acts hate crimes. Because to name them would be to insist 
that all lives matter can be equal, that the lives of Asian women matter, the lives of our grandmothers, our mothers, our sisters, our daughters. Thank you. Thank you so much to the poets, Shin Yi and, and Holly, and to Kate, and behind the screens, Luke and Brittany. But before we say goodbye, I want to, to talk to the, the poets and poetry lovers on the opposite side of the mountain. We've brought to you today a bowl full of our cultural lives, our griefs, our expectations, our wish for justice, and our, our um, words in that bowl. And I wanted personally to come to Spokane because my grandmother um, grew up on Five Mile Prairie until they moved into Spokane after the death of her, of her father. And as a girl, I would go to Post Falls to Aunt Kate and, and, um, and Uncle Oscars. And I remember so well the landscape. It was not mossy. It was not wet. It was not muddy. It was not always sort of damp and cold. It was east of the mountains. We would walk down to the Post Falls River and there was dry grass and warmth and a gravel road and a, a bridge that Cousin Dick would jump off of. And also back at the house, um, there was a great apple pie and um, children were always welcome in Aunt, Aunt Kate's house and my, and my grandmother's house. And then to go back a little further to stand on the Little Spokane River and look up at the Keenan Homestead and to bring what is my world now, which is the wet side of the mountain to you all over, over in Spokane who actually have a horizon. Um, I wanna thank you and I hope that over time and over this conference, you will fill our empty bowls with your words and your recognition of the crises we have and the um, work we have to do and the wonderful, wonderful landscape that we're allowed to live in. So thank you, Kate and Luke and Brittany. Thank you so much, Anne. That was really beautiful. I feel like you just wrote a little poem to Spokane there at the very end. So thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you to Anne, Holly, and Shin Yi for those beautiful readings. Um, I love that we also got to hear a little bit of context and stories behind the new work. Um, so that was great. And also to learn more about Empty Bowl Press and their important mission. So thank you again, Anne, for submitting the idea for this event. Um, and thank you to Luke, Getlitz Assistant Coordinator, and our intern, Brittany, for helping out behind the scenes. To Today. Um, and so for everyone watching at home, I hope that you'll join us for more festival events, both in person and here on Zoom. Please visit our website, getlitfestival.org, for our full schedule and more information about all of our authors, including today's talented poets. So thank you again for joining us, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks, Bye, everybody. everybody.